Good day class. So now we go into our second online lecture. Hope you all are still sane in this time of, well, abnormalcy. Pero, whatever. So now we proceed to our second topic for the second long exam coverage. If magkakaroon man tayo ng second long exam in the future. But I'm just covering my basis. We're now going into our mechanical properties. So for uh, the first of the properties of the materials, na we discuss natin sa Math E21. So first, what is your mechanical property? The mechanical property is basically the response of your material to the application of a load or force. So ang stimulus dito is force. And whatever the response of that material is, that is what we call your mechanical property. So we study mechanical properties because we need to understand how your material would perform or would react under different mechanical loads or stresses. Since ang goal natin as materials engineers is to create materials that can withstand whatever our process condition is. So kunyari gagawa ka ng bridge, Gusto mo din sa bridge mo ay hindi siya masisira pag maraming kotse na dumadaan sa kanya. So we need to consider the mechanical properties of our materials in that scenario. So hindi lang naman bridges ang kinoconsidera natin ng mechanical properties. Actually, halos lahat. One can say that for a lot of applications, the mechanical property of that material is the most important consideration. So yeah, mechanical property. So the different kinds of mechanical properties are your strength. So pwede siyang tensile or compressive strength. You have your ductility, toughness, elastic modulus, fatigue strength, wear resistance, creep strength, impact strength, hardness, and so on. So all of these are under the umbrella that we call the mechanical property of your material. So in the mechanical property, or in the discussion of the mechanical property, there are two important concepts that we need to learn. We have what we call stress and strain. For tensile and compressive loads, we define stress as your force over the area in which we're applying this force. So stress, engineering stress, um, usually represented by the Greek letter sigma, is equal to the force over A0, where A0 is the initial area of our specimen. Meanwhile, the engineering strain, or strain, is the relative ratio of the deformation to its original length, or E, uh, epsilon, is equal to delta L over L0, where delta L is the change between the final and the initial lengths and L0 is the initial length. So that's delta L over L0 that is your engineering strain. So for stress, ang units natin dito is usually pascals, that's uh, newtons per meter squared. While for strain, since we're dealing with two different distance values or length values, makita natin that your strain would be unitless. So if we now consider the application of a shear stress into a material, so pag sinabi natin na shear, yung application natin, the application of the force is parallel to the uh, plane of contact. Kanina, sa tensile and compressive stresses natin, makita natin na perpendicular siya dun sa object. Ngayon, yung forces natin pag shear yung application natin is parallel to the surface area. So for shear stresses, same lang naman yung formula, you have F over A0. So we usually denote our shear stress as the Greek letter tau. So F is the force parallel to our area A0. While your shear strain is gamma, where gamma is equal to the tangent of the angle of the formation here, delta. So, yung delta natin dito is this angle here. So, in, you, in low delta values, so pag maliit lang yung angle of deformation na yan, we can usually take that gamma would be equal to delta. 
So this is uh, parang approximate mo na equal na lang siya due to this property of the tangent function. So now let's look at some examples regarding our shear, stress, ah, sorry, our stress and strain. So first, a bar of material with a cross-sectional area of 50 mm squared is subject to tensile forces of 100 newtons. So what is the tensile stress experienced by this material? So recall that your tensile stress or stress is just equal to force over area. So we use force over area, 100 newtons over 50 mm squared. We get 2 megapascal or 2 million pascals. For the second problem, a strip of material has a length of 50 mm. Its length increased by 0.020 mm upon the application of the tensile force. Determine the strain for this material. So strain is just delta L over L0, where delta L is the change in the length of the material and L0 is the initial length of the material. In this case, delta L is equal to 0 0.020. Meanwhile, your length is initial length is 50 millimeters. Dividing 0 0.020 over 50, we will get 0 0.0004 or 4 times 10 to the negative 4 yung strain niya. So notice, nag-cancel yung dalawang millimeters natin na unit and we get a dimensionless value. So determine the properties of a material. We usually uh, take a sample of that material, depending sa type of material yung magiging shape ng sample natin, and we put it under a tensile test. So a tensile test is usually done using an ultimate testing machine or the tao nating UTM, so materials engineers. So what we do is we apply a constant strain. So we pull our test piece at a constant rate and we measure the stress experienced by your material. So the, the object or the device that measures that stress is what we call your extensometer. So usual sa tensile testing natin, again, the strain rate is constant. Ibig sabihin yung elongation ng ating material is a constant. And what we're reading using an extensometer is the force or the stress experienced by that material. So in tensile testing, ang actual na makuha ni UTM na values is actually force, yung resistance, resistive force ng material versus the length of the specimen. But by using math, we can convert that to stress versus strain. So upon tensile testing until fracture, we will get this kind of graph or this kind of curve. So this is what we call a stress-strain curve. Makita natin your stress is in the y-axis and your strain is in the x-axis. So we're charting the stress experienced by the material with strain. And mula sa stress-strain curve mo, makakita tayo ng different properties of your material. So we can determine the uh, yield point. We can determine the strength of the material, the fracture point of your material. So kung gaano kataas na strain or gaano kataas na stress kailangan for fracture gano kataas yung strength or gano kataas yung force na kaya mo withstand ng material mo and so on so in specifically yung makuha natin stress strain curve mo is your yield strength your modulus of elasticity we also call this your stiffness your resilience the ultimate tensile strength the fracture strength and ductility and toughness of your material Sa stress strain curve natin, makita natin meron tayong dalawang regions. Meron tayong elastic region and plastic region. So yung elastic and plastic regions natin, important yan since these are governed by two different kinds of deformations. And for now, ang elastic deformation natin, wala kang permanent deformation. Meanwhile, pag plastic deformation na, pag tumama na yung material mo dun sa plastic deformation na regime, ibig sabihin magkakaroon tayo ng konting 
permanent set deformation sa material mo. So, hindi na siya babalik sa original niyang kalagayan. So, elastic deformation, again, it is recoverable. So, for metals and for ceramics, elastic deformation is characterized or makita natin uh, may, maliit na maliit in the atomic scale, in the molecular scale, as the stretching of the bonds in your uh, bond lengths. So, pag nag-stretch yung bonds natin, pag pinakawala natin yung stress mo, ang mangyayari is babalik lang yung original length ng bonds niya dun sa pre-stressed condition niya. So, return lang siya to normal. So, you would have no permanent deformation. Meanwhile, for plastic deformation, um, aside from the stretching of the bonds, pag hindi na kayo nung bonds na mag-stretch to account for the deformation, mag mangyayari is magkakaroon na tayo ng tinatawag natin na either slip or twinning in which magkakaroon na tayo ng paggalaw pag-break, and pag-reform ng bonds natin. So, this would account for the plastic deformation which will lead to permanent set deformation in our material after uh, removing the applied stress. So, now let's look at the deformation in our crystals, the different mechanisms that govern deformation in our crystals. So, for elastic deformation, again, this is your recoverable deformation. So, before and after, we have to apply a stress, babalik lang siya sa initial length mo. So, in this region, makita natin from your stress strain curve kanina na linear, medyo linear yung region na to. So, in this case, we usually relate our stress sigma, our stress sigma here, with your strain, epsilon, with this letter E. This E is what we call your elastic or Young's modulus. When we're dealing with shear stresses and strains, we have the analogous, um, analogous na equation, tau is equal to G gamma, where tau is the shear strength, Tau is the shear strain and gamma is the shear strain. G is the uh, ito, yung constant of proportionality natin or tinatawag natin shear modulus. So, sa elastic deformation mo, assuming that your force is applied in the Z direction, if you try to elongate a material in one direction, usually yung other directions na, let's say yung X and Y directions natin, Liliit yung dimensions mo doon. So, the Poisson's ratio, V, this quantifies kung gano'ng kalaki or gano'ng ka-extreme yung pagliit ng other dimensions natin when we, when we subject our material to uniaxial loading or when we're stretching it along one direction. So, in this case, makita natin, if you stretch your material along the Z direction, and we expect natin is liliit yung dimensions na along the X and Y directions. And the Poisson's ratio for that one will be equal to negative strain or in the X direction over the strain in the Z direction or negative of the strain in the Y direction over the, ne over the strain in the Z direction. So, for isotropic materials, the Poisson's ratio can give you an idea between the uh, will give you a relationship between the elastic and the shear modulus as given by this formula here. E is equal to 2G times 1 plus V. For plastic deformation, makita natin that there will be a permanent deformation after we stretch or we elongate our material. In this, uh, in this case, we can describe the relationship between your stress and your strain with this equation here. Itong equation na to na nasa slide. Sigma is equal to K epsilon N. Again, sigma is your stress. Epsilon is your strain. N is some constant and K is some constant. 
So now let's look at what deformation is. Deformation is just the change in the size or the shape of a material brought about by an applied stress. So take for example this figure. So in Asababa, this is your original test piece. After subjecting it to tensile testing, makita natin humaba na yung length na to. Nag-deform siya. And makita rin dito, maba yung length. Nag-iba rin yung shape niya from straight. Naging parang conical siya until mag-fracture siya dito. So this uh, test piece up the above, makita natin this undergone extreme deformation that led to its fracture. So note for deformation, even during our deformation, the stressful structures are preserved. So take for example yung deck natin ng uh, cards. So deformation can be characterized by the shearing of planes or crystal planes in our structure. So even though gumalaw yung crystal planes natin, yung crystal structure ng material natin would still be the same. So dito, yung plane ng cards natin, it's still the same. Nag-iba lang yung position niya with respect to the others. So for the mechanisms governing the deformation in crystals, we have two. We have slip and we have twinning. So whether or not slip or twinning would occur in your material is dependent on the types and the amounts of lattice defects present in your material as well as kung whether the crystal structure niya would allow slip or it would allow twinning. So first, let's go into slip. If you look at the micrograph at the right, ito, if you look in this micrograph here, this is uh, this workpiece experience slip. If you observe, there are linear markings on our surface. Ito. The lines are parallel. And that if you look at the UTS or the stress strain curve of this one, the actual yield strength of this material would be much lower than its theoretical strength. So for slip, the process of plastic deformation in slip is through the shearing of crystal planes. So in this case, parts of your crystal undergoes a shear displacement relative to one another. So it's like kanina dun sa deck of cards natin. Para nag-move yung cards natin, some small position um, relative to the other cards na nagawa natin, na elongate natin yung card deck natin. So, same here. So, nag-shear siya pa ganyan to get this feature here. So, the lattice movement in this case, since shearing ay nangyayari, this must be done through the action of shear stresses in your crystal. If we look at slip, specifically, ang mechanism ng shear deformation natin is through the motion of our dislocations. Remember from our discussion from the last video, yung dislocation natin are linear defects found in your crystal. So, the appearance of slip or slip planes in our system or in our crystal would be due to the action of the motion of our dislocations. So, pictured here, picture dito is an edge dislocation. Since nakita natin meron tayong extra half plane dito sa taas. So pag gumalaw to, gumalaw siya, and it exits onto here, we would see will produce a step here. This is what we call a slip. This is your slip plane. And pag tinignan mo yan, under a uh, good enough microscope, makita mo parang yan yung linear marking na makita natin. So it's analogous to how a caterpillar moves. So the, this, the motion of that dislocation is analogous to how caterpillar moves. So dito, gagalaw yung caterpillar. 
ganun din yung paggalaw ng ating slip or ng ating dislocation. Pag nakalabas na si dislocation towards the edge of the crystal, will create your permanent deformation or slip. So for perfect crystals, to create slip, we need to be able to break all of the bonds at the same time. And we'll create these slip planes here. So slip planes and slip step. The problem is, and we try to induce slip in our perfect crystals, since we have to break all of the bonds, sabay-sabay natin dapat siyang gawin para mapagalaw yung ating dislocation. This is very energy intensive and mahirap siyang gawin. So for perfect crystals, slip is very hard to perform. But now if we induce dislocations of, or if there are dislocations inside our crystals, this would make slip easier for our crystals. If slip is easier, this would lower the strength of our materials. This is why yung theoretical strength ng ating materials is usually much higher than the actual strength of your materials. Since all of our materials usually have defects in them, these defects will tend to lower the strength of our materials uh, much, much lower than the perfect material strength. So now let's look at a defective crystal or a crystal that has a defect. So in this case, meron tayong dislocation here. So instead of breaking all of these bonds simultaneously to create our slip plane or our slip step, we can just break one bond at a time. So nangyari, lumipat ito, papunta dito, and you get this dislocation. Yung motion niya is due to the breakage of one bond at a time. So it's much easier, much less energy is needed, much less force is needed. Mas mababa yung strength ng material mo. So yung formation of slip natin, again, is through dislocation. And yung dislocation natin, this can be described with what we call our Burgers Vector. The Burgers Vector, B, this has a magnitude and direction, and this measures the distortion caused by the introduction of the dislocation in an otherwise perfect lattice. So depending on the type of dislocation, again, we have three. You have your edge, screw, and mixed dislocation. Mag-iiba yung values and direction ni Burgers vector mo. So first, let's look at slip via edge dislocation. So this is an edge dislocation. If we let this edge dislocation move to this side, we'll eventually get a slip plane, a slip step. So the movement of this would be like this, and you'll get your slip plane here. For screw dislocation, again, the itchura niya, the screw dislocation line mo, the movement would be towards here, and yan. Pag natapos na siya, nag-open na yung zipper mo, this would be your slip plane. So, itong plane ng yellow na to. Hanggang dun sa dulo. And lastly, for mixed dislocation, you have screw here and edge here. So, you have edge and screw. If you let the dislocation run its course, slip plane or the slip step would be found dito. Or ito siya. So we can notice here in this figure, whether edge or screw dislocation or mixed dislocation man yung mangyari sa crystal natin, yung itsura ng slip plane or slip step na makakuha natin would still be the same. So now let's define dislocation density. From the name, the dislocation density is just the density or the number of dislocations per volume of our crystal. So for different materials, meron tayong different dislocation densities. 
For slow cooled metal crystals, you're allowing your uh, metal to crystallize into uh, to order itself. So makita na there will be a relatively low dislocation density. For worked metal pieces, so yan yung pinokpok natin yung bakal or inapply natin ng mechanical work, makita natin that the dislocation density would be high. If you heat treat this work metal pieces, so we usually use recovery, recrystallization, or annealing, makita natin that this would allow some of our dislocations to combine or annihilate themselves and kakaroon tayo ng mas maliit na dislocation density uh, in compared to our work metal pieces since we're allowing the basically the crystal to reform. For ceramic crystals, your dislocation density is small. And for semiconductors, for semiconductors, usually we're dealing with very pure single crystal systems. And yung dislocation density nyan is as follows. Maliit din. So it's about 1 per millimeter squared. So now let's look back at our lattice strains. So pictured in the slide is an edge dislocation. And what we know from an edge dislocation is dito sa taas or sa baba, meron tayong extra half plane of atoms na nangyayari. In this case, meron kang extra half plane of atoms sa taas, mas magiging crowded yung taas mo which will lead to compression to happen at the top of the dislocation. Dito naman sa baba, since na-stretch nung bonds na to, mas malayo itong bonds na to than dito sa baba, magkakaroon ka ng tensile component there. So, those are yung lattice strains na ma-experience ng material mo. So, if we look at the interaction of our different dislocations, depending on whether similar yung signs nila, so similar yung T sign na direction nila or different, this would either lead to the repulsion or the combination and annihilation of our dislocations. So, if you have the same signs, or basically parehong compression sa taas and parehong tension sa baba, these two dislocations would repel each other. They will not combine, they will not annihilate. So, titigil lang sila dyan. Hindi sila gagalaw, nandyan lang yung dislocation mo. If magkaiba yung signs nila, it is as if mag-neutralize sila. So, dito compressive sa taas, tensile sa baba. Tensile sa baba, and dito tensile sa taas, compressive sa baba. Pag naghalo itong dalawa, man-neutralize nila yung strains ng isa't isa, mawawala yung dislocation natin dito. So, upon the application of stress to a material, we see that your dislocation would move. So, we have two different types of dislocation motion that is possible for your material. So, we have your conservative and non-conservative motion. Pag conservative motion tayo, along the slip plane yung motion ng dislocation natin. We call this your dislocation glide. Meanwhile, for a non-conservative motion, we have two different types. You have your climb and your cross slip. So, pag climb, this happens for your edge dislocation. Tataas yung dislocation mo to a higher plane. For cross slip, for screw dislocation, parang mag-iiba yung plane na pinupuntahan ng dislocation mo or propagation ng dislocation mo. So, yung non-conservative motion mo, this usually happens when yung conservative motion natin or yung glide, dislocation glide natin, is impeded by some kind of obstacle upon uh, with respect to the application of the stress. So, usually mangyayari itong non-conservative motions natin pag may harang dun sa conservative motion mo. So for slip to happen, this usually occurs on what we call our slip systems. So slip systems are combinations of our high density planes and high density directions in our crystals. So preferential tong high density planes and high density directions natin, since pag mas mataas yung density ng plane and directions natin, yung distance between one atom to another, is minimized. So, mas less yung energy na kailangan para mag-travel si one dislocation to another. So, hindi ganun ka taas yung kailangan mong energy 
least energy again would be easier to break yung bonds which allows the motion of our dislocation. So in this case, uh, let's take this two-dimensional uh, crystal. Yung dislocation natin will tend to either propagate along the A direction or to the D direction since this is the highest density directions in our crystals. And our dislocations will tend to travel in this high density directions since again, mas maliit yung kailangan i-travel ng atoms mo pag na-break yung bond niya para lumipat dun sa kabilang connection. Less yung energy na kailangan. So dito, less yung energy na kailangan na to, rather than going, let's say, from here diagonally to this one in C direction. So for metals, depending on the crystal structure, you have different slip systems. So for the first one, ito, this is BCC. The slip plane is the 110 plane. The 110 plane is itong plane na to. And the slip direction is along the slip plane along the body diagonal, the 111 direction. The number of slip systems in our BCC is 12. You have six slip planes and you have two slip directions per slip plane. For the FCC structure, for the FCC structure in the middle, this one, your slip plane is the face, oh, sorry, the slip plane is the body diagonal plane or the 111 plane in your system. And your slip directions mo dyan is ito, ito, and ito, which are your 110 directions. You have four slip planes in your FCC with three slip directions available for each slip plane, leading to 12 slip systems. Lastly, for each CP, Yung slip plane natin, or in densest plane natin, is your basal plane, the 0001 plane. And the directions of this is yung ganyan, ganyan, and ganyan. Or the 110 directions, or the 1120 directions along that basal plane. There's only one basal plane in HCP, multiplied by three possible directions in which our material might slip. You have three slip systems for HCP. So depending on the material, uh, other higher slip systems might be available to the material upon the increase in the temperature of that material. So for example, for BCC, in this case, the normal slip system niya is the 110 plane and the 111 slip direction. But in higher temperatures, mas activated yung bonds natin. Mas madali silang mag-break. Pwede nating activate yung other slip systems natin like the 211 plane and the 111 direction and the 321 plane 111 direction for the BCC system. So now let's uh, do a concept check. What is the slip system for simple cubic? So... I suggest you pause here and try to think for the answer for yourself. And once you are, um, once you have an answer, then I play you na only you slide. So in this case, the slip system for our simple cubic is the following: the one zero zero plane and the one zero zero direction. Since the one zero zero plane or this plane here. This is the plane with the highest density and the highest or the densest direction or the direction with the highest density is your 100 direction. Family of directions anyway. Clear ba? So if hindi siya clear, pwede naman kayo magtanong. So pwede sa comments or pwede nyo email or i-text. 
So another crystal deformation mechanism that is available for our crystals undergoing plastic deformation is what we call twinning. So in this case, uh, twinning happens when slip is unfavorable or there are few slip systems available for your system. So instead of dislocations moving in twinning, what happens is that in your twinning phenomena, there is a movement of a region, so of a region, this one, this region here, of our atoms, and this movement might enable the might enable our crystal to go into a more favorable position for it to go to slip. Not sleep, but slip. So in twinning, we have what we call your twin plane. So dito. Twin plane dito and twin plane dito. So in between that twin planes, dyan nakita yung deformation nung crystal natin. So again, in twinning, we move all the region of crystals here rather than moving our crystal planes one at a time, like in slip. So it's a twin plane natin, dito. If we look at the displacement of the atoms with respect to the distance to the twin planes, habang lumalayo tayo dun sa twin plane natin, lumalaki yung displacement nung atoms natin here. Tapos tinatawag natin twinning ang twinning natin since makita natin on the other edges of our twin plane so dito and dito parang continuous pa rin yung crystal natin. They are still symmetric sa region na ito and region na ito. So, in, uh, in the macro scale, twinning is manifested by serrations in the stress strain curve. So, parang magkakaroon ng maduming signal dun sa stress strain curve. Like so. Itong serrations na ito. And the clicking sound or loud tin cry that we can sometimes hear in, well, tin. So, parang ting, 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 ting. Uh, I forgot kung paano talaga siya. But, May lama niya siya once we go into uh, sana in future demonstrations. Hindi ko siya kaya i-voice out. <coughs> From the previous discussion, we would see that dislocation motion is related to the strength of your materials. Specifically, the strength of, the of our materials depend on how well they slow down the motion of our dislocations. So, dislocation is analogous to vehicles moving in a city or something. So, how do we slow down a moving vehicle? We basically, we just give them obstacles. So, same for dislocations. To slow down the motion of our dislocations, we provide obstacles that inhibit their motion. Basically, we attempt to make them stop moving. So, first is the presence of impurity atoms. So the addition of impurity atoms induces stress fields in our materials that makes it hard for our dislocations to move. So dahil iba na environment niya, mahihirapan ng gumalaw si dislocation mo as seen in the figures and the slides here and here. So nawawala yung impetus ni dislocation na gumalaw like Dito and dito, since makita natin hindi na ganun ka-strained yung environment niya, yung tensile and compressive forces is not that uh, hindi na siya ganun ka naga affect na mapagalaw siya, mamaalis yung dislocation na yan, mag na lang siya dyan, hindi na siya gagalaw, tataas yung strength ng ating material. Next, dislocations are also affected by another dislocation. So, pag meron tayong dislocations na nag-meet, again, pwede silang mag-annihilate or pwede silang mag-repel. 
So, pag nagkita sila at pareho sila ng sense, magre-repel sila, hindi sila gagalaw uh, mutually. So, we stop the motion of that dislocation. So, the motion of dislocations can be impeded by both interaction uh, scenarios, the repulsion and the attraction scenarios. So, in the repulsion scenario, so, two dislocations with the same sense, two dislocations with the same sense as seen in here, sa taas, if nag sila, they will essentially stop the dislocations from moving towards one another, halting the progression of both dislocations. Meanwhile, dun sa ating meet-up ng dalawang dislocation na magkaibang sense, makita natin that due to that annihilation, matatanggal yung dislocation, well, matatanggal din yung motion nila. We also have green boundaries. Green boundaries serve as barriers to the motion of our dislocation since kailangan mag-translate ni dislocation from one crystal structure to another, sometimes hindi enough yung energy para mapag-pass siya to the other green. So green boundaries stop our dislocation. And lastly, we have your second phase and precipitates. So these large second phases, this acts as if they are uh, other grains. They stop the motion of your dislocation by becoming an obstacle to our well, motion. So in summary, for the first part of our mechanical properties discussion, first, slip occurs when a dislocation moves and reaches the end of the crystal. Next, perfect crystals have higher strength because it takes the bonds, uh, basically dapat lahat ng bonds ang kailangan natin i-break para magkaroon tayo ng slip. Slip moves along a preferred direction in plane that we call our slip system. So this is the highest direction in highest density planes. And lastly, twin aids the formation by making the crystal more susceptible to slip. So with that, we end our uh, part 1 of our mechanical properties lecture. So, hatiin ko tong video na to since na-release ko masyado siyang mahaba and baka hindi ko na siyang upload sa YouTube. So with that, thank you for watching and I'll be uploading the next part in a separate video which would be tentatively scheduled on Friday. So thank you, God bless, and hope you are all keeping sane out there. Bye-bye!